Hello and welcome to Serlin on Design. We are going to talk about the Talos Principle video game today. All right, time to talk about the Talos Principle. And today with me is Mr. G hey, Phantom. Excited Hi there. to talk about Talos Principle. So let's go over the the design of this game. And that's what we do on the show. We're not here to review it, right? We're just here to uh, go over how it's put together and mm -hmm. and why. Uh, if, if we were to review it, though, I just real quick, I would give it a super high score, like at least 9.5, maybe 9.8. Oh, yeah. Also, another thing for our viewers out there or listeners, we are going to have a lot of spoilers, but not quite yet. At the very beginning, we'll talk non-spoiler and then we'll transition to we'll, we'll be clear when we're going to start spoiling things. So do you have like, just a just a high level, you know, give us your feels about this game before we go to it really has this covering of like a simple puzzle game that is uh, seemingly straightforward it's obvious that the budget of the game isn't super high but they make do what they what they can uh, but obviously there's a lot going on underneath the surface and that's where kind of the game gets the most interesting yeah i'm gonna come at this in a ironic way maybe and tell you how boring <laughs> this game really sounds if you yeah. look at it zoomed out so what is this game basically? It's sort of like the game Portal, uh, another puzzle game. So it's sort of like Portal if it didn't have any portals. Like if you took Portal and you took out the most interesting part of that game, then it's mm -hmm. sort of what it's like. And uh, if if the various like uh, elements that you had to play with to solve all the puzzles were all really boring, like just boxes that you put on buttons and laser beams that you shoot at a target. Uh, and also if I told you there's no animated characters, you're never going to like talk to anybody. So any kind of story that the game want to conveys uh, has to be done through reading text on a screen or like occasionally you'll hear a recording of a, of a voice, but mostly it's just reading text on a screen. So that is, that does not sound to <laughs> me like a recipe of like, one of, if not the single best puzzle game ever, but s somehow they did it. So when you say, you know, they did a lot with what they had, I mean, th I feel like that's exactly right. They did an incredible amount with what very little they had to work with as far as like scope and, yeah, and definitely. budget. I mean, it's funny because the way you describe the game, you would think this game came out in late 90s, early 2000s, right? Because that's what you described is that that's the type of game we would get. Um, but I think the, the simplicity on the surface, like I think that was a very um, purposeful decision for what they were trying to make. So we're still trying to avoid spoilers. And I want to just talk a little bit about the puzzles and theme without ruining the big right. secret that they have going on in this game. Uh, so about the, about the puzzles, uh, I'll say, you know, again, this is for people who maybe haven't played the game yet. They're, they're really getting so much mileage out of every little thing in this game. So you've got, you know, I mentioned like boxes and, and lasers and there's some force fields and a jammer is a thing that can open a force field. You find that in the first like one second of the game. So that's that's not any kind of mechanical spoiler. But how you use these things exactly like if you know if you have a jammer you can open a force field but if you have a second jammer you can carry that through the already opened one and then you can open the one you are you can you can hold open the one you just opened from the other side and take the first jammer through so you start to you realize like instantly like in the first you know two minutes of the game or whatever that if you have two jammers you can you can carry them with you through a puzzle maybe uh or and like a box can be put on a button, but also these laser targets that you're uh, kind of bouncing around. You can put one of the connectors on top of a uh, a box and raise it up, and now you've changed the elevation of the lasers, and that could matter in the puzzle. And you have to connect. Uh, well, they're called connectors, so you connect them to various different laser targets, and then if you move, if you pick it up and move it, you actually break all those connections that, okay, that's just how their UI works. But that little detail about when exactly are those connections broken when you move something like you got to understand that in order to deal with several of these puzzles. My, my point is that each element 
like they they've really it's clear to me they really tested every possible thing you could do with it every little trick every little way you can combine things and then made puzzles out of all of it like really really thoughtfully really fully exploring everything mm-hmm. you can do with these objects yeah definitely it's through that simplicity that kind of makes the uh, puzzles deeper than they you know first come off right they just get a lot of mileage on that stuff and it makes you think about not just placing the correct tools in the right places, but then deactivating them at the right time. And not just the combination of tools, but like your choreography around the map to kind of get to your goals. So about the story, uh, again, the non-spoiler thing is, I just want to touch on the its general vibe. You are a robot, which you can tell from looking at the cover picture of the game. And this game takes place like in the future. And a lot of the story has to do with like looking back on the past and how humans were a, a long time ago in our present. And a lot of it is this really poignant and touching. Okay, it's very philosophical, but it, it also it's also pretty emotional. Another thing they have going on with the story is kind of a self-referential thing, uh, something about recursion. So just as an example, and, you know, I don't consider this a spoiler. It's such a tiny thing. There's there's all these texts that you uncover from a long time ago. And one of them mentions like the Library of Alexandria, where that archive of human history was lost. And so a lot of knowledge is lost. And we only know things from that time because of scraps of paper or whatever. You know, the things that were the people of that time were going to discard. But we happen to find those. And that's why we know about what went on back there at that point in time. But in the actual Talos principle game that we are playing, exactly the same thing is happening. We have a computer that's been corrupted and we only have access to scattered things of the past, often not things that people thought was important at the time. Uh, And so that parallel, I mean, it's very on purpose, but it's also really interesting. And it kind of makes a a little bit of a puzzle out of the story to try to piece together, like, what is the meaning of all this? You know, how does it fit together? What happened in the past? I mean, I think this game really shows also just the importance of good writing (laughs) and engaging writing because the majority of the story is through text. It's through this corrupt computer. All these uh, writings have to have personality, uh, some way to engage with it. Even the terminal that you're interacting with, it can't just be a terminal that is uh, purely instruction. There's a hint of like fun going on with interacting with the a terminal uh, and the writing within kind of the character of, you know, this broken computer um, that allows it to be engaging, that allows you to kind of like be able to care about this stuff and to also look forward to it because these, you know, when you get to the writings and the musings, they are essentially rewards for you getting through some of these puzzles. Not only does it reward you with kind of world building and story, but it also gives you a break from the puzzles as well. So it kind of helps you balance out the experience of the game. Um, But that only happens if you have strong writing. (laughs) You can't, if the writing was bad, it would be a slog to get through. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Uh, It's basically the pacing that you're talking about. You know, you're solving puzzle, puzzle, puzzle. It's pretty dense with Mm -hmm. puzzles. You know, you solve a puzzle, you walk a few feet and there's another one. So having some story in the form of computers that you read uh, to break it up is is a pretty good way to do it. And it also gives you the freedom. Like if you don't want to read some stuff on their computer, you don't have to. You can go to the next puzzle. It's like up to you. Uh, what you want to do and when you want to do it. I, I found that really good. Uh, all, all of this is about Tell's Principle 1, and I'm, I'm just bursting at the seams to someday tell you how much of a different story mm-hmm. Tell's Principle 2 is. But For now. For now, we're yeah. only going to talk about, about one, and it is very well-paced, Absolutely. I think. I think we've reached the, the, the point where it's hard to say more. They're really... I think there is a big thing to say about this, and it's the reason that I wanted to do this whole episode, but we need to dismiss the people who uh, are are afraid of spoilers. So before they go, I want to tell the, I want to tell you something, if that's you out there. If you have not played this game and you have any interest in puzzle games, I would really 
urge you to go buy it and try it. And I'm going to give you a little bit of advice, okay, about whether you should cheat or not. Okay, so I'm pretty good at this style of game. I didn't cheat anywhere with one exception, and I suggest that you do the same. And that is there's this puzzle about uh, a giant clock on the ground with Roman numerals at one point. That is the stupidest <laughs> puzzle in the game, and you should cheat on that. You should look it up. Uh, it's a blight on the game. They remake it. They should remove that puzzle. <laughs> Awful. Go. Don't feel bad about just looking that one up. It really breaks the kind of unwritten rules they have for the rest of the game. Uh, also, there's a bunch of uh, Tetris going on in this game where you solve puzzles and you get Tetris pieces and then you got to not not like real time where they're falling, but like a static puzzle where you put mm -hmm. tetrominoes together. Uh, they're not that hard, but uh, they're stupid. So just you can just cheat on those. No, you know, you're, you're yeah. fine. The The real <laughs> interesting meat of this game is everything else, everything that is not Tetris and and that one puzzle. So I would urge you to go play that and then come back and yeah. watch the rest. There's uh, no excuses because uh, this is this game is like on every platform available. Um, I, I played it on my yeah you, yeah you play right. it on I played iOS, it on my iPad right. Um, it's also the cheapest way to enter the game. So if you're like you want to play and like save money, get get the iPad version. It works great. Um, it's the same exact game. Uh, so definitely, definitely give it a try. I'm bad at these games. Okay. So, you know, Serlin's good at them. I'm bad at them. But so far, I've been able to get through all the puzzles I have gotten through. So um, I, I think it's, I think you'll, I think most people would be okay. It just probably takes me longer. <laughs> okay, there's one more thing that we have to tell these people before they take off, and that is that they should try my tabletop game, Puzzle Strike 2. Puzzle Strike 2 is a two to four player tabletop game, and it's kind of similar to old school puzzle games like Puzzle Fighter, or you could think of Tetris a little bit. In this game, you're combining gems and you're moving around, trying to line them up to get the right colors. The more gems that you have, the closer you are to losing, but also the more ammo you have to send at the opponent. So it's always like right on the edge about whether you're going to just explode with too many gems or send a million to them. And then they're going to have to have like a incredible miracle turn where they deal with the million gems you sent to them, maybe send them back to you. That's what the game is really designed around is this, these back and forth miracles. And it has some really pretty components with those gems. Absolutely. Custom molded, uh, uh, a beautiful gem. So, yep, uh, try it out. And now we'll get back to Talos Principle. Okay, it is time for the spoiler edition of talking about Talos Principle 1. So we can finally just say what we want because everyone, you know, who needs to mm -hmm. go try it has already left right. and they're going to come back. So the, the big thing that I'm dying to say about this game is the stars, mm -hmm. the star puzzles. So th there's regular puzzles. You, you, you know, you walk around, you see where they are. They're all numbered. They're not, they're not hidden from you or something. And then each area, it has a few star puzzles, which are like the extra challenge puzzles. And sometimes you can't even find like, where, where is the star? You know, and, and it's, it's tricky to even know where it is. Uh, and, whether or not that's tricky, sometimes it's just mm -hmm. sitting there in plain view. It's really tricky to get those stars. And it's it's clear that they that the designers have in mind like a higher tier of difficulty that the stars can have. Like I I think they what they're doing here is they're they're being very conscious about the problem of like getting stuck in a puzzle game. So like if it's everything was linear, it's like Okay, there's 10 puzzles and you have to do puzzle one and you have to finish that to get to two. And if you want to do like number five, you, you know, you can't. You got to do one and then two and then three. If that's the way you design your puzzle game, then people are going to get really stuck. You know, they, they can't figure out one and the, there's like nothing else for them mm -hmm. to do. But when you let them, when you let them, first of all, go to just about anywhere they want, you can gate it a little bit, you know, you like to get to the the third the last third of the game or something you've got to like at least yeah. solve enough but with a when you give them a lot of leeway uh that helps with being stuck and then it's really great to have this higher level of difficulty that you don't as a player you don't even have to yeah. do them 
You know, they're, they're kind of optional, but they're like the, the real juicy challenge. Uh, you know, I have more to say about these stars because the stars are the star of the show. But um, before I gush more about it, I d just wanted to get your your take on them. Like, how, how did you feel about them? How, how easy or hard were they? How interesting yeah, so, were they? Yeah, so, I mean, the stars, I mean, just call out to that completionist spirit <laughs> that I feel like just a lot of gamers have. And so when you start to notice them, uh, you do kind of get into this mindset of like trying to figure out how to get them. It's like discovering the stars in Mario games. You're just like, okay, well now I have to get it. Uh, and now I'm, now I'm on the lookout for them the whole time. And I do want to also talk a little bit about the open, the openness of the puzzles and the fact that you can kind of just go to any of the puzzles and how important that is. You know, hopefully it's okay for me to mention other games. So another game I want to mention would be Elden Ring, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought of that too. As, uh, that's what Elden Ring really did differently than the previous right. Souls games, right? It became, uh, it's not that they were mm -hmm. strictly linear, but they were more linear exactly. than Elden Ring. And so the openness of the puzzles could have been bad, right? The game could have been way too open open world where it's like you're traveling all all of these places and getting lost that that's not the case here every there are guideposts all over the place it's just that you can take on the challenges at your speed and like you know some puzzles are i don't want to say easier but some puzzles utilize the tools in a way that's more intuitive maybe for you and so you can kind of get all those you know done but through all that you're also building your skill you're kind of like thinking skill and your puzzle solving skill which will eventually help with like getting those stars right so let me go into these stars more i think there's a huge thing that really elevates them uh, that's makes it elevates the whole game and makes the whole game something yeah. really special so i'm going to talk about that and there's a kind of a secondary boost that piles on that has right. to do with the story but um first the part that that doesn't have to do with the story just the puzzle mechanics so there's regular puzzles and star puzzles and the following is not a rule that's written down anywhere it's just becomes apparent yeah. by playing the game that the there's a kind of an unspoken rule that in the regular puzzles that you can solve the puzzle somehow with what you're given right like that that the puzzles are all Tricky, but they are what they are. You have your tools in, in front of you and yeah. you solve them. Uh, you, you solve the regular puzzles. But the star puzzles are about breaking the walls. They're about like going outside the puzzle, like literally physically. A given sub world might have four puzzles in it, but you actually walk from the the boundaries of puzzle one, you know, in a, in a miniature mm -hmm. overworld to get to the next puzzle. So that could just all be nothing. Just who cares what it is? It's just like a hallway mm -hmm. to get to the next puzzle. But it matters a lot, like exactly uh, what's out there and what angles. Like one, like if if the door of one puzzle points to another, you know, you can actually have things from one puzzle interact mm -hmm. with another. So for the regular puzzles. They would never do something like in order to solve this, you've got to shoot a laser from a different puzzle <laughs> yeah. into this one. They wouldn't do that. But for the star puzzles, they absolutely do it. And it's yeah. the whole point. And uh, it's a huge epiphany. It was like one of the most exciting moments in gaming for me when I realized the first time playing through Talos Principle 1. Like I don't remember exactly where it was, but when I realized like, oh, these are not just completely separate isolated puzzles they're related you can take an object from one to the other if you're clever enough you can shoot a laser from one to yeah, the other really do you happen to remember remember when that hit you yeah so like for me it was definitely you know when i when i realized that you're kind of you have to break the boundaries of the game uh and the spaces uh, i realized like i mean first it was a game changer so it changes completely changes the perspective of your game of the game uh, when you realize that um, the main puzzles are they're not really it's not the game actually <laughs> uh, we are led to believe that yeah, that is the that's game right. 
and you certainly could play it like that. But um, it became very clear to me that the game is about breaking those boundaries and that you playing the regular puzzles is all about figuring out the big puzzle, right? Because there is the big puzzle in the level that you're trying to solve and going, but you do have to like, you have to solve the little puzzles. You have to solve the main puzzles to kind of figure out all the tools that are in there and the possible pathways. And some of them are, you know, some of them don't contribute, but others do. And so it really opens up kind of like how you even look at the, how, how you look at each puzzle, because not only are you trying to solve the puzzle to get the item there to get your Tetris piece, but you're also trying to look at all the corners and be like, okay, well, is this, is this like an opening for me or can this beam go over there? It, it really changes your perspective of the entire game. So it's really, it was a really kind of, you know, uh, that aha moment that kind of like, oh, okay, I get it now. This is the real challenge of the game. And so that that's really exciting. And I think if, you know, if you're kind of looking for something that has that kind of challenge that really changes your perspective on on games, on the game. Well, if you're listening to this, you, you might already know about that. But, you know, it's it's something your, your friends who haven't played the game can really look forward to. Yeah, it's been many years since I played this game for the first time. So I, I can't quite remember the exact moment for me, but I, I think maybe I do. Uh, there's a puzzle where there's all blue lasers, but then there was one red target and you're like, well, what's, what's that about? There's no red laser in this puzzle. Like why, how is that, is that just, you know, to screw with you or, or what? Oh, you can't open it. You can't shoot the red laser at it. So just kind of forget it and move on. And then like it hits you that, the door of that puzzle is like exactly facing the door of another puzzle, yeah. like perfectly. And that other puzzle does have a red laser and mm -hmm. a red connector. And it's, I, th I think it might even have, I think, I think in that one, uh, the specific one I remember, it's actually like a red laser source that's visible even when you're in the mm -hmm. other puzzle. Like you're looking out the door of your puzzle into the other door and you see this sort like it's perfectly lined up. And so once you see that, you're like, oh, I've been so stupid. You know, it's there all along. But, but I didn't think to look for that or I wasn't even thinking about that. And then once that enters your mind, it's like you're completely yeah. poisoned. Like you can't look at anything anywhere in the entire game the mm -hmm. same again. Everything is now about when I shoot this laser out the front door of the puzzle what can mm -hmm. that access? Which other puzzles can that get to? And uh, stealing a box. I don't know if you stole any boxes, but that's that's the big thing in that game. Uh, getting a box yeah. out of a puzzle, out into the into the yeah. outer into world. Lobby. And then sometimes, sometimes into yeah. another puzzle mm -hmm. is even a thing to get various stars. Uh, so yeah, then you start looking at at things on, on a meta level, you know, like you're not trying to solve an individual puzzle, but it's like you have maybe four puzzles in a, in a given zone, for example, that those four puzzles are now your, your palette. Those are your, those are your yeah. tools all together. And you're like, okay, there's got it. Like, I know where the star is out in this world and it really looks like you need a box somehow. So which of these puzzles mm -hmm. has a box? Like, oh, only one of them. Only one. So that means either there's a the way to get a box out of that one puzzle or they've hidden a box somewhere mm -hmm. in the outer world. It's so which is it? And I mean, I'm just I'm going through this as this an example of like what's going through your mind as a player and how different and exciting that is compared to the normal yeah. puzzles <laughs> where it's like there's just like a thing in front of you that yeah. you do. And, that's and I think it. it's also important to know that. um like, I think coming from the outside, it can sound like it's like an overwhelming challenge. It's like, oh, now I got to like worry about four puzzles simultaneously. And I I think they did a good job not making it feel like that, right? Because you, you can imagine a version of this game, which is not as designed as carefully, where the 
where the clues are just a little too hard to figure out in terms of like, oh, if you need a box there or if you need a connector here. Um, so they did a good job at like making it not, not feel like you're trying to manage too many things in your head, but it's just that you're just like kind of like being a little bit more skeptical about the map that you're in, right? You're looking at those corners just a little differently, but you don't have to like, <laughs> you know, you don't have to like overwhelm yourself with too much information. That's what I was afraid of when, when I kind of discovered that was the, that was kind of the intent of the game that, Oh, it, it, you know, you're trying to unlock these stars and that, you know, this whole map is the big old puzzle. It didn't, didn't really turn out that way. When you say, Oh, that map has a box. So is it that, or is it this other hidden box? It's not like all of them have five boxes and you have to figure out which box you got to get out of them. Um, which I think could be overwhelming, but it is, it's something that is like manageable. And so I really appreciated that. Um, again, and it also helps you not cheat, <laughs> which, you know, I know, you know, which would be a failure of the game if people were cheating all over the place. Yeah, I, I mostly agree. Uh, I have played it through, I think mm -hmm. twice in total, many, many years apart. So I forgot sure. almost everything. Uh, you, you may not have played it to the very end, so you might not have seen some of the harder things they have going there's some pretty challenging that, stars yeah but i feel honestly. like i feel like if you get but, that far um, you're you've now invited that to yourself as opposed to you know the scaling is good <laughs> it's not like super duper hard now it can be too needle mm -hmm. in a haystack uh in theory but they've managed to avoid that because of of how uh, they've chunked everything, put mm -hmm. things in chunks. The structure of that of the game is that there's like world A, B, and C, and then within world A, there's eight mm -hmm. sub worlds, and then when each within each of those sub worlds, that that's like a set of yeah. four puzzles that you can carry things between. So whenever you're trying to steal a box from one thing and take it to somewhere else, you're talking about like on on the order of magnitude of like between yeah, four puzzles right. you're not you're not talking about like between a hundred puzzles exactly. which probably probably wouldn't have worked uh but they managed to make even like four or five puzzles plus a couple stars that use things between them like extremely challenging i mean i have a couple in mind uh, this damn weather top level for one i'm sure the people out there who've played it will know what i'm talking about <laughs> Okay, I want to pick up on something else you said that it was making you skeptical of mm -hmm. your environment, yeah. right? Once your eyes were opened to what they're doing, you didn't take things as given quite so right. easily. Like you, like you see a, a wall that's like a little bit too short and you start to think, you know, there's a real possibility that I could maybe jump over that with, with this box. You know, I'm not just crazy like that. I, I feel like that might be what's going on right here. So you're you're skeptical, right? Is that, that's that's what oh, you're yeah. saying? Exactly. I think, that sort exactly. of thing. You're just all of a sudden you're looking at all the heights of the walls. You're all of a sudden looking at like all the directions of these lasers and the way they possibly can go. You're just like, there's something going on with all these levels, or not all of them, but there could be something going on. So you have to you have to look at it skeptically. You have to be like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know about this wall. I don't know, I don't know about this gate. I feel like. There's an exploit here. So I want to read you a quote from the game that, mm -hmm. you know, you've just reminded me of. I happen to have it open here. Okay, here we go. They say doubt everything, but I disagree. Doubt is useful in small amounts, but too much of it leads to apathy and confusing uh, and confusion. Sorry. No, d don't doubt everything. Question everything. That's the real trick. Doubt is just a lack of certainty. If you doubt everything, you'll doubt evolution, science, faith, the morality, even reality itself. And you'll end up with nothing because doubt doesn't give you anything back. But questions have answers, you see. If you question everything, you'll find a lot of what we believe is untrue. But you might also discover some things that are true. You might discover what your own beliefs are, and then you'll question them again and again, eliminating flaws, discovering lies, until you get as close to the truth as you can. Uh, it goes on. Questioning is a, a lifelong process and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I think you get the idea, though, that th this is 
this is a lot of the theme right there. We can use this as a transition to talk about the story because this is really what the story mm -hmm. is about. Uh, I'm not sure if you played through all of it to see all of the story. So maybe I should just summarize I haven't, it. But no, let's let's just or, let's just go through it. It's fine. So I'm sure the people who are, you know, made it to the spoiler section pretty much know. But just to cover it briefly, what's going on here is that the uh, bellowing voice in the sky named Elohim, who's kind of like, you know, your dungeon master of all these puzzles, he's telling you, um, yeah, just enjoy the puzzles. You know, it's it's my garden. It's it's all very beautiful. Uh, but don't go to the tower. That's bad. It's bad if you go to the tower. Do all the regular puzzles. And the way you do, you do the tower is that you unlock uh, you unlock it through all the star puzzles yeah, we talked exactly. about. Right. So you do all like all the difficult stuff where you're kind of breaking the puzzles and doing mm. things between puzzles. That lets you get to the tower. Elohim doesn't like that. He does not want you to do, yeah, do he's, the tower. He's not a fan. Uh, and yeah, yeah. He's not a fan of it. There's a lot of other characters who like, it's, it's a little bit surreal what's going on. Like they're in their own simulation, you know, of the world and, but they they can kind of talk to you through written messages here and there or little ghosts mm -hmm. of what they're up to. Uh, and so they have different takes on this and some of them are like, Oh, Elohim is such a, like a great dude. And like, let's all listen to him. And he's like a God. And then other people are like, I don't know about any of this. This is, you know, there's, there's some lies yeah. they're hiding from us. And then other people are like nihilists and they're like, you know, what's mm -hmm. the point of any of this? Like, what's the, what's the point of mm -hmm. existing? What's the point of puzzles? Uh, and uh, yeah. Okay. There's, there's a lot of philosophical yeah. musing about that. Now, here's something you might not know, but uh, you'll get a kick out of learning, I think. Do you know what happens if you go along with Elohim, if you do what he wants you to do, which is to solve the regular puzzles and then go through the big magical door that you can open when you solve the yeah, regular puzzles? Yeah, I do puzzles? know what happens, and this is... I do know. You do know? Okay. Oh, okay. I know that the game the game resets, go ahead. and you're, go ahead. Just, you're, you're back to square yeah, one. That, that's right. So why does it do that? It does that because the the actual truth of what is really going on is that the entire world is a simulation of many different AIs and you're just one of those AIs. And it's it's like an audition. It's like trying to find the AI that does what what the creator of all of it wanted to do and the creator is not Elohim. Elohim he is only a character. He's just an NPC, you know, not not the author of the world. The author of the world wanted someone who thought outside of the box and questioned things and used lateral thinking and was endlessly curious and could not accept an authority figure saying, you know, don't look into that. So the real success of the game is if you can climb the tower and get to the end of that. And if you instead were to listen to Elohim and just like kind of play it by the book and don't do anything too crazy, it isn't even that you fail to achieve the real goal. It's that you like utterly failed. Like you, you failed, you know, philosophically, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it shows that your AI is just garbage and it's, and it's reset. I think it's so beautiful. They did that. It doesn't really matter. Like it, it doesn't wreck your save file, yeah. you know? You can just restore your save file. So they're not being like malicious about it, but they're making an incredible thematic point there. Yeah. Uh, did you do it or uh, uh, is that, how, did you well, actually do it? The, I know about it because we've talked about this game in the past and I remember that we talked about that. Oh, oh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't remember yeah. telling you that. Okay. So, Maybe I told um, you. but yeah, like, so I knew about that. I didn't do that um, because, uh, well, for one thing, you told me to get the stars. And once you discover the aha moment of the, of the stars and the puzzles within the puzzle, uh, within that bigger canvas, you get into the 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 flow of like, okay, well, I, I should probably unlock these. Just as a gamer, <laughs> right? As someone who's always trying to like be a completionist and collect stars and get all the power ups and minimax stuff, you know, um, I'm. I'm just that way. And so you, you kind of just try to get that stuff. 
Well, you'll be yeah. a good AI then, you know, you can't help yourself, but That's to get right. all the yeah. hard stars. So it's, it's fun that the, this game really kind of uh, celebrates that from like the perspective of like people who don't do what the instructions tell us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And now that we've discussed several elements of this game, I feel like that in this discussion that we're having, we have assembled enough of the pieces of what this game is about that I can like fully say what I think is so mm -hmm. amazing about it, like design wise. And it's, it's partly the, uh, I guess a resonance that was kind of similar to what we talked about in the ghost of Tsushima and that game, we really liked it because a lot of different things lined up in the, in the gameplay and the theme. So it's partly that mm -hmm. again. Uh, and it's, and, but it's more than just that they lined up like, cause you could, you could line up, you know, awful, boring <laughs> things or re like really sad things that make you want to cry and be depressed all day. So it, it, it's lined up, but it's also like a great thing anyway. Okay. So what have they, they lined up? The one word that sums up the whole thing is the word transgression. I think that's the theme of the whole game. It's what it's mm -hmm. all about, about doing things that you're like not really supposed to do. Uh, so you're, you know, you're not really supposed to shoot a laser from one puzzle right. to another, you know, but you secretly, you secretly are, but you feel like you're, you're like cheating or you're breaking it when mm -hmm. you're doing it. And so it's, it gives you this like, you know, giddy feeling yep. of glee. So like if that, if the theme, if the story, it had nothing to do with that, you would still feel that, you know, it's just, it's just a really fun thing to make a game oh, yeah. about. But then it's a whole other level when that is what it's about, <laughs> right? It's about finding the AI that is the uh, ultimate transgressor. So, you know, that just, uh, it's just so perfect. And it's also perfect to put it in this structure of a puzzle game where you have easy puzzles that Elohim, not easy, yeah. that's the wrong word. You have they're difficult, difficult but puzzles. They're, they're structured. <laughs> that, that, that Elohim, yeah, you, you have, I guess, difficult, but inside the box puzzles that Elohim wants to do. And then you have like a whole other level, you know, that regardless of any kind of story, it's like it kind of needs to be optional, mm -hmm. right? Because not everyone can do all these. So uh, gameplay wise, they, they need to have that separation. But then story wise, it just f fits exactly right to have these two kinds of puzzles you know the the garden path ones and the transgression yeah. ones so th i just felt that really uh, worked totally. amazingly well i'm going to give you one other thing before you can you know th then i'll let you comment on your take on uh how these things lined up but um it, if i were just done and saying you know that that's what they did that's like amazing a plus right there and there's another story element that they they added in. I feel I feel like they didn't have to go into this one, but I like that they did. And and it's all the stuff about consciousness. They're way deep into the philosophy of <laughs> consciousness, which is something, you know, I, I've been interested and in, studied on my own in yeah. psychology. And it feels appropriate here, right? Because you are a robot and you are the successor to humanity. Mm -hmm. Humanity's over. And so there's a lot of questions about like, are you really a person? What mm -hmm. What is a person? Can an AI be sentient? Um, y you know, I mean, I, I'm, there's no question in my mind that artificial uh, life could, could exist. So I'm not really wrestling with that, but, <laughs> but again, it, it's about the, the journey and looking at it from every angle and, you know, thinking about the the fallacies or the arguments for and thinking about it in different yeah. literary ways and, and so on. Like it it all makes total sense to exist in this game about a robot solving puzzles to prove that it's ingenuitive and, and clever enough and curious enough to be human like. Like that's just oh, it just fits together Absolutely. so well. So uh, well, yeah, did you, you have any you know, yeah, well, I mean, we can talk about so many things about in terms of the story. Um, again, just getting so much narrative in there with so little. It, it's really incredible. The first thing I want to just point out is how matched the theme and the gameplay is. I think it is. 
you know, like you said, for for Ghost of Tsushima, you know, we really praised it for that. But I think the for Ghost of Tsushima, we really praised it because there were just so many things that could have not matched that they did such a good job of that. But this is a this is a case where it just matches so perfectly. I think this match is so incredibly strong that uh, it feels like it obviously had to be that. But at the same time, when you kind of look into it and like think about how the story is built and the writing and everything it must have been incredibly hard <laughs> right like just as 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 in a creative endeavor to marry those aspects uh the theme the theme of the story and the gameplay together so seamlessly what i really love about again transgression and breaking the boundaries and the rules um is again celebrating that kind of gamer mindset of like you know breaking the game right like we are encouraged to break the game. Like when you, when you first get your first star, you send that beam across the, the, the map from one puzzle to the other. It feels like you're breaking the game. And there are so many instances where we as gamers or as just people who are trying to like, you know, go through systems and rules and stuff. We're told, Oh, well that's, that's wrong. You're, you're not supposed to do that. Elohim. Uh, Elohim and Elohim does tell you that mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like don't do that you're not supposed to do that he's the voice in all of our heads of hey uh don't break the game I like you said incredibly fun but also refreshing to be celebrated for that to be like no we want you to break the game like this is this is the playground that we've created and the point of it is for you to like figure out how to like cheat basically right I mean, it's not cheating. It's all at the end of the day designed, but it certainly feels that way. And that's the fun of it. But I compare it to like the speedrunner who finds that broken part of the map to shave off five seconds of our time. It's like it feels like that. And it's just totally built into the game to give you a lot of those moments. And, you know, you would be if you'd be worried that. Oh, if you know, if the game is totally built on that, you'd lose that feeling. But I feel like, again, they did such a great job at balancing the difficulty of all that stuff that you don't. It just it all comes every time you do that. Again, it feels like you're shaving off time of your speed run or something like that. It feels really good. And I think it I think it also has other kind of good real world messaging as well that also makes the game's kind of narrative and design uh, kind of a positive message for people. Right. That in real life, you should. Uh question authority and yeah. seek <laughs> to look outside the box and seek to know what is true, but don't question everything, not every, everything to the point of, you know, doubting right. science and exactly. so on. There's a couple things that you said I wanted to pick up on there. So one of them was about speed runs and the other one, uh, you know, you remind me in case I forget in the middle of my story was about how the story of the game seems like exactly yeah. the right That's one right, yeah. to have chosen. Okay. So, so about the speed run part, yeah, it's it's a funny parallel, isn't it? Because in speedrunning any game at all, like Talos Principle included, but just any game, speedrunners are constantly breaking games, right? They're constantly doing things that they're not supposed to do. And that's the whole fun and challenge of speedrunning. In playing Talos Principle myself, not as a speedrun, just, you know, trying to get through it, I often joked, like, okay, I have a jammer and... uh I can open this force field with it, but I can't just carry it with me through there. You know, like that, that's the rules of the game. Don't let you do that. Well, unless you're a speed runner because speed runners can just <laughs> break it. <laughs> any, any rule I've, I've watched speed runs of, of tells principle and it's, it's absolutely demoralizing right. because there's the, you know, things I spend hours looking at. How do you get this? How do you do the correct solution to do this? And there, they do some broken thing about like they can get a thing through a force field that you're mm -hmm. not supposed to get through. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what my point is, but real speedrunners are trans transgressing all over the place, and then we get to play a miniature version of it through uh, yeah. Tell's principle. The other thing that I wanted to comment on about you saying how you feel like it's exactly the right story. Yeah, I mean, and, and I want to tell you the degree that I think is exactly the right story. Let's say you told me we were going to make a new open world, like Ghost of Tsushima style game. 
And and then you're like, okay, I know you like Ghost of Tsushima, but you can't just make that game again. (laughs) Okay, you got to make a new game. I feel like I could do it. You know, Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to have their story. We don't have to have their weapons. We there. There's a lot of things that they did a really good job on that. It's not like you have to do it that way. They just did it Mm -hmm. one good way. But I don't get that same sense in Talos Principle. If you told me to make a puzzle game, like, and you said, you know, we know you like Talos Principle, but but don't be too close to it. Okay, well, you should have, you should have the same game structure of, uh, you know, that we we've gone over here about chunking things. Like here's here's a like three or four at a time, and you can do them in any order. And there's stars. And the stars link things between the puzzles. And if that's what you're going to do, you just made it about transgressing, mm-hmm. like it or not. And so now you should probably have a story that's about that. And it's sure convenient to have a story about, you know, a bunch of AIs testing to find the one that is the most transgressive. And if you're going to do that, then you should probably have a whole thing about consciousness. I feel like you just end up with the Talos principle when you do this all yeah. correctly. Like they, they've done such a good job that I would find it difficult to, to stray from it. Like, I, I don't know about, like I used the term that my mind is poisoned earlier by realizing that I can take things between puzzles. And so that's all I can see. And now that I've seen their way of doing a puzzle game, it's just so good that it's, it's hard to, you know, not do that sort of thing if you were yeah, to make totally. your own. It just, it's such a perfect match and they have a sequel and we'll talk about that one day, but like, it's just hard to imagine one upping that (laughs) even, even if, even if you're making a sequel, even if it's just like, well, we're making the sequel, so we should be able to, because we're making a sequel, but I just, it's hard to imagine a more perfect fit. And let alone if you're like some other person trying to make a puzzle game and, you know, trying to you know, not, not just be a game about solving puzzle one, two, three, four, five to the end. Right. Um, well, you can't do that. Right. Like just in general, that is not a thing that you can just do anymore. I just don't think players would accept that as like an acceptable way to play these games. (laughs) But so then the other option is chunk it stars, uh, interconnecting, um, puzzles that aren't supposed to be connected and you just get back to tells principles and <laughs> and you're kind of stuck so about tells principle two i'm gonna stay true to my word and not say anything about yeah. it right now but i will say that i thought the same as you before seeing yeah. tells principle two i thought how in the world are they gonna make a sequel to this like yeah it's a tall order Absolutely. you know they already sort of did it oh oh we should also mention the uh expansion I, you oh, probably yeah, don't yeah, know anything I, about it. I don't need to go way deep into it. Just the the high th- level thing that you should know about it is it it is an expansion, you know, in a traditional sense. It's it does not have new mechanics. Okay, you, like you got jammers, it's new content, connectors, but not, and all that. Not a new game. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, there is a bit of new story. There's a new area called. Uh, Gehenna or is it new Gehenna uh, where the, the, the AIs there are basically prisoners who are too mm-hmm. free thinking and Elo- Elohim like kind of sequestered them, you know, into their own, into their own area. Um, the puzzles in that game are notable because even though they don't have any new mechanics there, the, many of them are extremely difficult and they often use what I would consider like, edge case mechanics, like things that existed, but you didn't really even know about, like just to give a real quick example, if you uh, have a red source and you shoot it at a red target. Okay. So you got a Mm -hmm. solid line and you've seen it a million times as you play the game. Then suppose that you had a blue source and a blue target and, and you, you had crossed them like with an X. So that, that doesn't work, (laughs) you know, like, one of the beams stops the other, and so they yeah. so they don't work. Okay, so you know that because you've right. played the game, but what you but what you don't know is like, well, exactly what are the properties of it 
when it doesn't work. What if you could like make a bunch more that don't work and like, can you flicker them on and off and how do they flicker? And like, what if, you know, what if you get multiple colors all going to one of them and this, you're not really supposed to do that, but like which color takes precedence when during the flickering, like there's a bunch of weird mm-hmm, stuff mm-hmm. like that, that, that it really, it feels like testers like found crazy things to do and then they made uh-huh, puzzles yeah. out of them. So, um, you know, the, I'm not saying they're all about flickering some intersecting lasers. That's, there's like, you know, a couple that are like that. But that's the that's the vibe is that uh, they're really exploring the edge cases. And the one puzzle that is so notable uh, is called Crater. Oh, people try that one. Don't look it up. I solved the, all of these without looking anything up. So you can too. Crater is so notable that it is the most memorable puzzle to me in just about any puzzle mm-hmm. game I've ever played. I felt like I had a PhD in Tal's <laughs> principle to solve that puzzle. Like the the level that I was on was like it was not even what steps would solve this puzzle cuz it it was I felt it was too hard. It was too hard to ask sure. what steps would solve the puzzle. Instead, I needed to like think I was like writing a paper on it. Like what can we say about <laughs> this puzzle? You know? Like can we get two boxes over here ever i'm not saying that that would solve it but just like can those boxes Mm -hmm. ever be there or or not and you know what i'm saying analyzing properties about things that could be true or false (laughs) about this puzzle the scientific (laughs) method (laughs) okay so that that's the expansion road to get you know we'll see if i get to that the only other couple things uh i wanted to cover Mm -hmm. before we wrap up uh I do have some criticisms, um, but before we can say that for the very last, uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts about, I guess, the accessibility, or I don't know if that's the right word, but as just as someone that doesn't normally play this style of game, like, did you did you find this kind of as off-putting as other games uh, in this genre, or or less so, or was it more inviting or easy to get into? Like, yeah. You know, so to get over the hump of, of being new to the style of game, like did they do anything good or not? Yeah, really? that's a great question. I think, I think they did some things really good, uh, really things that helped. So first off, the first set of uh, puzzles were, you know, they're, they're easy, but they get you, they get you, they get you used to the tools very quickly and they introduce. Yeah. They're teaching you the tools through, through like kind of having their, their there's like nothing to do except yeah. the right thing. And then you realize, exactly. Oh, that's how it works. Um, but then, you know, right, right. When you get that per- past that first area and you hit your kind of first um, lower intake um, that really does keep you. Cause again, the writing is so good and you know, we, we only touched upon this, but again, the world building is really good because there's no characters telling you their, pers- you know, there's no like, Like you said, there's no animated character or voiceover and someone to just tell you this stuff. You have chunks about the world that used to be that is informing you about what what your what your life is for this character and what the world you're living in is. And it's really engaging the again, because the writing is so good. It's so interesting. And that really does help keep you engaged to be like, okay, well, I want to. I want the next lore intake. I want. I want to see what's going on, and um, uh, Elohim is a very is a really good foil to you as well. Um, he's the only he's the only voiceover character. You know, it's the only character that really does talk to you. Um, well, it's not the well, only it's not one. the only one. I mean, there's there's the, the recordings of Alexander Drennan, for example. I have they have voice, but uh, yeah, Elohim's like yeah, like yeah. literally talking. I mean, yeah. To Outside of the recordings. Well, about uh, being, a, a, you know, not, not so into puzzle games. Like, is it is it that the early levels d- did well enough that, that it kind of put you on solid enough footing to engage with it? Like, well, was that the key no, I think the, thing they did? Or, or is it the... The key thing well, is the... Um, the key thing is balancing the pace. That's really it. So you're not like... Mm. One, you can go to any puzzle, which is really important. So if one's really giving you trouble, just go to one that's 
not giving you as much trouble, right? Two, when you are doing the puzzles, they're they're you know they are the perfect size. You know, you're not you're not gonna be there. Okay, you could potentially be there for hours if you just can't figure it out. But like, generally speaking, you're not there forever, right? You're it's a quick kind of quick turnaround for you to kind of get in there, get the puzzle done. Once you figure out the once you figure out the dance. And then you can go to the next one. So the pacing is really nice. It's like a short yeah. story, right? Like like everything kind of has a point and then it's over yeah. quickly and it's not it's not bloated. There's That's not right. a lot extra. And there's a theme to the the puzzles too. Not not the, the not a story theme, but like a theme to that design of the puzzle, right? And it's usually like in hmm. the title of the of the puzzle that you're in, which is really helpful. You know, yeah. the the three doors, right? Yeah, I don't know if that's one of them, but that's actually an example. Yeah, then you'll know it's about right, opening exactly. those three doors or whatever, if exactly. that was the so, name of like, it. So, like, you can wrap your head around these puzzles. And so those are all things that, like, help someone who might not be into puzzles kind of just get in there and just do them and tackle them. And the reward okay. the reward for kind of getting through them is good because you get nice writing. Those are Those are the things that it does really well. The pacing, the length of the puzzles the feeling of like that rewarding feeling of like breaking the game. Um, those are all things that like really help. Uh, and it also helps that like it's fast. You're not like slowly walking around, like you're walking pretty quickly throughout the map. I'd like to just say a few criticisms yep. uh, and then wrap up. Uh, I've already said earlier in this, that that one puzzle about the, the clock, uh, I give a huge thumbs down. Uh, that one, the reason is because you have to look up something in the real world outside of the game. And I felt like that was totally outside the bounds of like kind of the, the rules that these puzzles set up. And I know someone out there might say, Oh, but the whole point is to go like outside the box. Yeah. That's too that much. Just, it just really <laughs> rubs me the wrong way. It felt, it just felt wrong and stupid and it wasted my time. It wasted a lot of my time looking for solutions within the game when it's about looking up something on the internet and ugh, they, they needed to lay a foundation if they're going to do that. And they shouldn't, they, they're, they have a really great thing going. They don't need to put that in there. Uh, so the next thing I mentioned before is about Tetris. The inclusion of Tetris in this game is absolutely mystifying. And I, you know, this this maybe sounds like I'm joking, but I'm I'm not. I, this is my real theory. I'm thinking that the, how did this happen? Why Tetris. is there so much <laughs> Tetris in the right. in this game? I can't imagine a team of people that all thought that that was a good thing to do. So, my theory is that whoever is in charge of this project really really likes the Tetris thing, and everyone else just grumbles and gets <laughs> through it. All of the developers are just kind mm. of told what to do. And they're like, well, whatever. The head guy, the boss guy thinks the Tetris thing is great. I can understand how it was suggested mm -hmm. in the first place. Because you you need when you solve a puzzle, you need to get something. You need to get an object yeah. or a check or something. And it would be cool if the things that you got combined to be another puzzle. That actually sounds like a really cool idea. But to make them Tetris is just tedious. And as the game goes on, it gets more and more tedious. Like at first it's like, it's, you know, it doesn't really matter because you just solve mm -hmm. it like instantly. But then there starts to be so many Tetris pieces you got to put together. It just like takes a while. And then you wonder what are you doing? Cause it's not interesting or fun at all. So I, I just don't get it. And I wish they mm -hmm. didn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> like it, if they replaced it, the entire thing with like a really interesting meta set of puzzles, maybe, but that's like kind of too much work yeah. and not necessary. Just cut it. I do. I do have a couple <laughs> more things. Um, so Easter eggs. Now I know there's some people out there who criticize that, you know, there should be more Easter egg. There's actually a lot. There's a lot of little secrets like to <laughs> find in this game. My criticism is not that there aren't enough. It's that they, they're annoying and they stomp on the toes mm -hmm. of the puzzles. The, the one, I don't, you probably don't even know this, but there's this, there's one with a moon. There's a giant moon in the sky. Do you, do you happen to know uh, that I level? know the level, but I'm going to miss the, 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 the following details you're going to tell me. 
Well, I'm going to ruin it well. for you, you know, or people can turn this off if they don't want to know about the stupid, unimportant Easter egg. But uh, so on that level, uh, I wasted an unbelievable amount of time and it's because of some Easter egg thing. So there is secretly a connector that's on mm. that moon, the moon, a million billion miles away. There's a there's a connector and you can see that by using a uh, telescope and there's a telescope on that level. And then there's a key that lets you use the telescope. And I realized that you were supposed to use like a key, you know, to to get to that. Um, and there is a one of the puzzles on that level in that world. It has a key, you know, it has like a giant floating, glowing purple yeah. video gamey key that's mm -hmm. used within the puzzle. And I thought, oh, you can get that key out maybe and you can uh, use it on the telescope. And that is incredibly hard. Like I had to develop new theories about how the purple doors work. Like, you know, you can't take a thing through a purple door. There's inner purple doors and outer purple doors. And do they have different rules about these keys? Like, can you walk through one and still have the key? If you walk through an inner purple door and still have the key and then and then escape the puzzle, can you use the key somewhere else? Okay, anyway, after spending all this time and like doing incredible feats of magic to get the, the key out, which I finally did, it's 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 really like it feels like you are breaking the game to be able to do it. It feels like even beyond like what mm -hmm. a star is supposed to be. I did it. And you know what happens? Nothing, because that's not <laughs> what's going on. There's actually a tiny key that's just right next to the telescope. And what they're doing there is they're like, okay, let's make a new kind of object, like a tiny key that you can hardly even see that's only going to be used mm -hmm. for this Easter egg. But now they're like making it feel like it was, I thought that it intersected with puzzles right. and it, and it didn't. In that same area, it has another Easter egg. <laughs> I won't even go into it, but there's a whole other Easter egg that's, that's there too. And so, that one plus the moon one is a lot of decoy elements that you might think are involved with getting a star, but they're all there just kind of for fun to do mm -hmm. a stupid thing. So like I get, I get the idea of Easter eggs and that's like a cool idea, but when they're actually like kind of stomping on solving the puzzles, I've, I found that annoying. And then my final uh, criticism, yeah, you know, maybe you could like wave away some of these other ones, but this is, I feel like they, they should really have thought about this. And if, you know, I'm biting my tongue about Talos principle two, we're really gonna, gonna mention mm -hmm. this again later, but um, the recording puzzles. Okay. The puzzles where you, you press a button and then the game will start to record you moving yeah. around. And then you press the button again and then, you know, your recording does a thing in parallel to you in real time doing a thing. So those puzzles uh, are really mm -hmm. annoying and they're in like a sweet spot of badness where some of those are like not actually yeah. that difficult, but they're really annoying to think about. They like hurt the brain to think about. And it's to the point where. Uh, I would like see that a puzzle had that and would just groan instantly. Just like, oh God, another one of those. Like, can't wait till we can clear those out and get some non recording ones because they're just so damn annoying yeah. to solve. I, the feeling uh, I have with those recording ones, we go back to this idea of choreography, of, you know, the rhythm of going through this game, uh, solving these puzzles. Those always felt like that feeling of having to wait for like, a child to press a button for you at the same time you are, even though it's you, but it, it has that feeling of like, Oh man, I gotta, I gotta rely on this weirdo yeah, thing. Yeah. To, and, and then I have to perfectly do my, my choreograph and man, I don't want to manage that. <laughs> Another really weird thing about those. So yeah, yeah, you do have to, you know, there's choreography about it doing a thing and you doing a thing at the right time, even though you had to, actually do it at different <laughs> right. times to set it up. Um, when you are playing back a recording, when you move objects around, they have kind of a special rule. Like, like uh, 
because the recording saw it one way and you're seeing it another. And so to represent that, um, there could like a box will have like a blue mm -hmm. ghost box that the recording is seeing and then the real box that you're seeing. So any object, any given object, like a box or a connector would have its real version and its ghost version. Okay. That's weird and hard yeah. to think about, but okay. Uh, there's, there's an uncomfortable number of recording puzzles in the game that involve starting the recording, doing nothing. You just standing there and waiting and waiting and waiting and then stopping the recording. So you didn't even use it. You didn't even do mm -hmm. anything with the recording. But what you did was you created a window of time where now for the next several seconds, all the objects you touch can have a blue and a, mm -hmm. and a regular one. And then you can solve the yeah. puzzle with that. That's like weird and stupid and subverts the point of the recording, but there are several of those. Um, so I thought those were kind of the weakest mm. of, of the game. But even despite these shortcomings mm. and complaints, you know, it's a it's pretty damn great. Uh, I I I wonder, you know, if it is the the number one puzzle game of all time to me, and I th I think it is. Uh, I think it's. It's earned that in my cool. brain. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't play a whole lot of them. So the fact that this one has kept my attention, um, it means it's very high on my list. <laughs> okay. Well, I've, I've said everything I needed to say. So unless you have any more, we'll say no, goodbye I think, to everyone. I think that covers everything. Okay, everyone. Well, if you even slightly like puzzle games, go try. And if you Tales don't like Principle puzzle one. games, give this one a try anyway. All right, mm -hmm. take care.